All right, let's go to voting. So as you said, Ryan, there's a lot going on here. Early voting is here, but there's also some very interesting developments in those close races that we want to watch. Let's put this up there on the screen. Oh, so man. we got uh, Osborne is making waves. Here we have- This is the counterpoints bump. Yeah, you, dude, you guys were first to it. So we got to give you the credit. An internal poll now shared with the New Jersey hotline shows Dan Osborne at 50% ahead of Deb Fisher. 50% for Osborne. 44% there for Fisher, 6% undecided. Now, obviously, that's an Osborne internal poll, but you know, they it don't matches get all the other polls that have come completely. Out, yeah. And there have been a lot of polls recently that at the very least show it leaning away from Deb Fisher, so much so that they had her tied in an internal poll leaked by the Senate Leadership Fund, which is the major super PAC that backs Republicans who are running for Senate. And now Mitch McConnell and his guys are considering having to flood the zone and spend millions of dollars actually backing her. Now, keep in mind, though, he's still got 44%. So 6% is undecided, so it still could be 50-50. You have to bank on a decent amount of Republicans who are you know, not even thinking about the race um, in the state of Nebraska just because it's such a hard GOP state. But, I mean, if we're making the bull case for Osborne, it's not just the positions and all those, but having made abortion such a keystone of his campaign, it's not the worst thing because that has worked in Kansas. That has mm -hmm. worked in Kentucky, right? In a lot of these other deeply red states, Ohio as well, for these referendums. So to make it on that, and also the key part, he's independent. He's not a Democrat. He doesn't even say whether he would caucus with the Democrats mm -hmm. or anything. So you really, you can't project onto him a lot of this like, oh, he would be a vote for you know Chuck Schumer or any of that. He's running really as his own man. So I'm, I'm very interested to see how he does. And if people remember from when he did his interview here, he describes himself personally as pro-life. Yes, he's and like he, personally pro-life. And yeah, he exactly. uses the phrase pro-life, right. which is charged and tr triggering to Good some point. people on the left. Right. But who it, cares? He's running Nebraska. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He's exactly. He's so what he's doing is yeah. he's signaling that he shares kind of the social conservative values that a lot of Nebraskans have, but he is fundamentally more libertarian uh -huh. and and believes that it it's not up to him. It's, it, that this is his personal opinion. That's not how he's going to legislate, and that that's a 70, 80 percent position right there. Like uh -huh. you're going to capture an overwhelming majority of people. What, what this poll and all the other polls around Dan Osborne also show is the cost of being a Democrat. Like this, <laughs> this stigma and the stain of the Democratic brand in rural America is so profound. Yes. Uh, so if you look at a, another statewide race, uh, Pete Ricketts uh, leads Democrat Preston Love 53-37. Which that's is that, brutal. and that's how every right. other statewide race in Nebraska is going to go when you have a standard Republican and a standard Democrat. If right. Dan Osborne were running as a Democrat. He's done. He wouldn't even know his name. Who? Right. Yeah, who? Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, the, the union leader? Right, yeah. Read the, led the Kellogg strike? This guy sounds cool, but too bad he's going to lose by 20 points. Yes, yes. So according to the numbers here, he's basically outpolling the Democratic average by 20 points. So that's the price. So that is, yeah. that is the price, at least in Nebraska, of being a Democrat, having a D on your name yep. is 20 points. Makes you unviable. And also, everything's working out here for him in the sense that Deb Fisher is She's like, like yeah, completely replaceable. Totally. Like, uh, but all, actually, but it's not, it's not like he just happened to luck on mm -hmm. a, a replacement level Republican. The way that the Senate is structured now makes it so it's very much like the House. You just do whatever the majority leader or the minority leader that's tells right. you. That's right. You don't really do anything. You do a little no. bit of, con if you're actually decent at your job, you do constituent services, and that's about right. it. So yeah. the, the days where people could, you know, you have to be an incredibly uh, talented politician at this point to break out as a senator. Mm -hmm. And Deb Fisher was just never going to be that. She's just the Chamber of Commerce, like, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce when she got in, Trump, now that Trump's the thing. Uh, and so voters in Nebraska are like, all right, well, this other guy sounds cooler. Yeah.
Well, I like it. You know, listen, we'll see. I like to shake things up. Odds so, are still against him. I think but Deb polling is I'll, incredible. I was going to say, I'll be honest. I think Deb is probably going to win. But winning by two in Nebraska is humiliating. And so, mm-hmm. listen, you know, these things, they take some time. So maybe somebody learns that. And the next thing you know, another union leader in another state tries it. And all you need is like, what, a terrible storm on Election Day? And then shockingly, you win. We have a yeah. Democrat who represents the freaking state of Alaska right now. Remember? Remember Doug Jones? In Alabama, that was, I mean, a Democratic Mm -hmm. senator from Alabama. It can happen. (laughs) It did happen in my lifetime. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, Did he lose again? Yeah, but you never know, you know? Also, for people curious, and I'm curious for your take on this, I am very confident that if it were decisive, he would caucus with Democrats, or at yes. least he would. Well, you shouldn't say that. If you want him to win, you shouldn't say that. But it's not my job. I think he would. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But. He would extract so many different pounds oh, of yeah. flesh yes. for for Nebraska that everyone in Nebraska, and I think people in, in Nebraska understand that he's running against the Republican. Right. So. Who was the senator? Is it Indiana? Who was the Democrat under Obama during the two thousand nine? Is that who I'm talking? Wait, Luger. Is that who I'm thinking of? Dick uh, Luger. Dick Luger. The, yeah. No, he was. Who did he represent? He was, was he Missouri? Uh, let's look. Dick up. Luger, Missouri. Let's see this. All right, Dick Luger, Indiana. Yeah, he was yeah. Indiana. Uh, and I remember him in the, uh, no, and and Nebraska. Be, was it Ben Nelson? Ben Nelson. That's yeah. it, right. Ben Nelson. Yeah. I remember him voting, was it 2009, like you whatever that Carey. rescue yeah. plan was. And mm-hmm. he was like, oh, I'll do it. But there's, there needs to be a billion dollars coming yes. to uh, come Nebraska. And he got it, too. You, it was actually remember amazing. what they called it? Uh, no, I don't. The Corn Husker Kickback. That's right, the Corn Husker <laughs> Kickback. Uh, and so, yeah, for people who have been in politics, this was a huge thing. This, what, this is what led to Republicans banning earmarks in 2010. Uh, because that was before the Tea Party wave. The Corn Oscar kickback became like a massive political discussion. When Republicans take control of the House, they then ban uh, they ban earmarks, I, I want to say for over a decade. And it became the predominant policy. I think they just brought it back or somebody did yeah. or anything. But that's what the lasting legacy of what that Corn Oscar kickback was. That's what I was thinking. And, and it got taken yeah. out because yeah. it was so... <laughs> It was it was so right. dumb. I mean, yeah. I don't I, I don't care. I remember yeah. I was reading a story once about LBJ and the Civil Rights Act, and LBJ had just become president, and he needed some guy to like sign a discharge petition. I think the guy was from Purdue, uh, this Purdue's like district in Indiana, and he said something along the lines of, "He's like, listen, NASA, they've got a big contract. They could build it in Purdue. They could build it somewhere else too." <laughs> A lot of that depends on the signature right now. And he was like, all right. you know. And, and to his day, they still have it. So uh, it worked Mar- out for him. Mary Landrieu yeah. uh, got- She uh, was Louisiana, is yeah, that right? She was yeah. a senator from Louisiana. She yeah. also got bought off for her vote on mm-hmm. the Affordable Care Act. Hers was called the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> I like it. Man, politics used to be more fun yes, back in the day. Was. Southern Democrats were such an interesting, <clears throat> like, a, such an interesting breed that unfortunately people who watch politics, they just won't even yeah. know anything about. But uh, let's let's continue down this road. Man, enthusiasm right now for early voting, crazy. Let's put this up there on the screen. Uh, what we have right now is that the Georgia early vote has shattered all records. We have some 200,000 votes that were cast on the very first day in Georgia. The previous record for early voting was 120,000. I mean, that is just absolutely stunning. So actually, uh, the total now that they've uh, looked at it is 328,000 as of uh, late last night. So that is 123% higher than the old record from 2020 when a lot of more people were early voting. Now, for all, all the people out there who are like, oh, that's good for Democrats. No, Republicans have significantly changed their tune on early voting. And in fact, you have Republican mm-hmm. activists who are just going hardcore, beating down the door, the, you know, getting people, you need to go out, you need to bank your vote, we need to make sure that it's done right now. So that is partially going to explain some of those answers. What we, And I believe Georgia is one of those states where the demographic data, all of that is like hard to capture. I've seen some of this in Michigan too. Michigan mail-in ballots are crazy, but nobody knows who these people are exactly. But from it, what we know is that enthusiasm is still very high amongst the party faithful. The question yeah. is, is that is turnout going to come back to 2020? There's, there's really no way to know. Impossible. How hard was it uh, inside the Republican coalition to get Trump to be supportive of I mean, he's still mail-in. not supportive though. If you ask him about it, he'd be like, well, he's still a problems with mail-in right, ballots. But, but it's to, more that he's silent To get him to the it. place where, he, well, he tells people go vote early. Yeah. Well, well yeah. okay. Well, what happened is, is 2022, they were convinced that they were going to get a landmark victory in 2022, and then they got 
got blown out. And so I saw a lot of them. It's funny, the language they use. They're like, well, if the left is going to ballot harvest, then we need to ballot harvest too. But watching them in practice, people like Charlie Kirk or Scott Pressler or all these guys, they're just, they're like, okay, this is the landscape. Let's register as many people as we can. Let's get their damn votes and let's get them to the ballot box. Ultimately, that is the only actual way to victory. And if they do win, that will be a huge part of it. It was the get out the vote drive by a lot of these people instead of having to rely on early votes. So with Trump, he's never truly made his peace with it. But the people who know and the people who are really running elections and who want the Republicans to win, they have very much made their peace. They're like, look, this is a system we have, can't change it. Literally Democrats, Democratic governors rule five out of the seven swing states. That's a remarkable statistic. So that tells us also that, you know, they have no chance at changing whatever the ground is there. You have to, you have Mm -hmm. to work to make sure that it's uh, redone. So it's up to you. And I think we're going to see national voter ID, you know, as soon as we ever, as soon as we ever get a functional Congress, that's going to pass something again. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get it. And it's because Democrats are now becoming more of the upper middle class, oh, yes. middle class party, <laughs> and Republicans are the ones who have more working class mm-hmm. support. And so, voter ID, <laughs> anything you do to, you know, if, if you look at the look at the numbers when they go from registered voters to likely voters, mm-hmm. like throughout my entire lifetime, Democrats did better among registered voters but worse among likely voters. Yes, that's right. Because they had, more, in they had more working class support. Yeah, flipped in 2018. And so yeah. if you make it harder to vote and you have more working class support, your vote share is going to go down. There you go. And so yeah. that's why Democrats fought it and Republicans yeah. support it. Now it's, that's flipped. You're going to see all of a sudden the <laughs> principle is going to be reversed. I like it. I can't wait until Republicans are like, well, you know what? Let's, well, are we oh, sure listen, that uh, they, just let them sign a signature? That actually there. will be hilarious. I did see somebody was claiming what they're going to do is make student uh, um, Republicans will say student IDs don't count. Oh, like that'll yeah. be their which like, look. You know, it's a state university. It is difficult because there is a lot of like low key voter fraud that does happen where people who don't live in that, that, that yeah, voter fraud is yeah. real. No, it's it's true. I'm, I'm, I'm by the way, I'm not making a stop. We're, and we're at the heart this is of a it. decades long weird thing. We're, we're yeah. at the epicenter of it yes. in D.C. Yes. So many people who have lived here for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are actually, never registered to vote. They just vote back in wherever uh, they're from, Wisconsin right. or Pennsylvania. And they're like, well, that's it's not fair. I yeah. wouldn't be able to. Have my vote counted if I that vote actually, here in DC. It's I like, no, I don't know if they yeah. technically committed voter fraud. I I think I voted yeah in Texas 2016, requested a absentee ballot, but I think I qualified because I was a student who was out. It, there's something mm, about residency right. law or anything, but like you just said, but people work here for 15 happens, years exactly, and they'll keep voting in Pennsylvania stay, and or then whatever. They keep requesting mail-in ballots. That's where it gets difficult. Okay, let's continue with the uh, actual polls. Let's put this up there on the screen um, from Nate Silver. He now has the race officially 50-50. Harris at 50.1% chance of winning. And you have Donald Trump at 497 So that's it. I mean, you know, what else is there to say about it, right? <laughs> it, uh, got him incredible. Uh, it's like, come on, Nate Silver, you got one job. Yeah, and you're uh, just telling us it's 50-50. That doesn't help us. But well, if it is 50-50, that's what he's got to I say. I think that's what, uh, yeah. I actually think it's helpful. It's good for no, people I know. Yeah, to yeah. see where it's at. And so the real thing that has happened is the tipping point states, for example, like Pennsylvania, Right now, he has Harris at a 53.5% chance of winning Pennsylvania and Trump at 46. But the thing is, is that Trump has gone so much higher in the last couple of weeks. So for example, October 7th, just like a week or so ago, he had it at 42.4% chance of Trump. And now he's up to 46.5. So a slew of polls in the upper Midwest and then the assumption uh, that Trump will overperform in those places is really what is ticking him up. So yeah, Michigan, overall- Michigan and Wisconsin. And this was the f- huge yeah. fear of uh, Democrats who have been following Kamala Harris's yeah. career the whole time, that, okay, there'll be an initial burst of enthusiasm, uh, but then she will revert to her more centrist instincts. And mm-hmm. she doesn't necessarily believe anything, mm-hmm. but if she has a gravitational pull, it is to, it is to the center. Yeah, And she has ditched the, the one thing that, the public, I think, liked about uh, Biden, which is his re- his his advisors and his rejection of kind of neoliberalism. Mm-hmm. That actually implementing the things that people said they liked about Trump's populism, uh, you know, low, low unemployment. Yeah, you know, 
they hate the inflation from 2021 yeah, that do. has that has taken like since then to like rattle its way out of out of the economy. But in general, the strong antitrust stuff, strong anti corporate stuff, um, strong pro worker agenda, and she just uh, refused to embrace that. It's interesting. Yeah, I really don't know uh, what a lot of it is. At the same time, they're going hard on this Cheney coalition. Right, and instead, it's... Yeah, so well, let's show people that. Yeah. I mean, this is... So Tim Walz, he was on the campaign trail. He was bragging about it. Let's take a listen. The only thing more amazing is we got Bernie Sanders, Dick Cheney, <laughs> and Taylor Swift all on the same ticket. Well, there you go. All right, so uh, we got Bernie Sanders, Dick Cheney, and Taylor Swift all together, and, and I'm like, imagine bragging about that. But they were—they love it. This Cheney they thing, they love it. It's—it's—it's. It's, it's, uh, we heard, first heard it, and it appears he got it from Amy Klobuchar, um, who also made this joke previously. Take a listen to that. She has brought with her independents and moderate Republicans, right? You saw the event with Liz Cheney, you know, and it's only a matter of time where we're going to see like a, a bus going through Western Wisconsin. With, I want you to picture this, Bernie Sanders and Dick Cheney together <laughs> holding a sign that says Brat Fall. Okay? Like that, is like, that is our plan, okay? So that's that they like it, Ryan. They love I mean, having Dick Cheney. I, I will never understand that one. I don't get it. Also, there's no way Bernie Sanders is doing that. But the fact that Democrats are floating, I know. That, that, How is Bernie the, the not fantasy out about that too. I mean, you know, I mean, he like, has, he has, he has, yeah. he has said like, I Dick Cheney's a war criminal, and, <laughs> and I, I don't support yeah. a, being involved with Dick Cheney. But guess what, Bernie, you are. Yeah. Um, th and they're going to keep reminding people that that you are. Yeah. The only way that this is exciting for you is if you simply believe in taking power for power's sake. Mm -hmm. Because then, yeah, of course, if, if you have everything from Dick Cheney to Bernie Sanders, then that would, that would suggest in the old world that you've got everything. Yeah. Like you're going to, I mean, in, in the Democrats' old understanding of the world, you're going to win with 100% of the vote then because that's far left to far right. What they're missing is that so many in the middle don't see themselves on that spectrum anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's an excellent point, and it's one that is uh, genuinely concerning uh, for for what the future of politics. And look, it's you know, you could say it's terrifying if Trump wins, right? He's got this coalition, that he's he's abandoned a lot of the stuff that he used to run on, and it'll just be pure culture. But like, isn't it equally terrifying that it's like, oh, now Dis Ch Dick Cheney's yes. in power? And, and for I think that's, honestly, I'm I'm scared. And for for so long, for, to, yeah. the, to those of us who were uh, recoiling at the, at Liz Cheney being yeah. embraced cool. by the Democrats, they would say to us, "Look, it's just Liz Cheney. Yeah. It's not Dick Cheney." Yeah, but it, no, and it we, is. And we yeah. would say, "Yeah, but Liz, Liz and Dick, they yeah. have the same politics." Yeah, yeah they she, don't disagree she, on. She it. didn't wage the Iraq War, but she right. has the same politics right. as Dick Cheney. She supported and they'd, it, and they'd say, "No, no, no." But you know, this, it's not Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. And now it's actually Dick Cheney. Yeah, who is somehow still alive. Right. First I, of all, how, I, okay, how is he still Test alive? out this theory on you. Uh, I think she gets sec def or sex state. What do you think? No. Okay, no. why not? Um, Everyone says she won't get confirmed. I don't buy it. Why wouldn't Lindsey Graham vote for Dick Cheney, uh, for Liz Cheney? Of course okay. she would. I mean, they're, they're not- And Democrats have been praising her for the last, like, three years. She's a hero. She's, I, she, I think- She keeps saying she's going to put a Republican in her cabinet. The, Who do you think she means? I think the reason, the reason I say no so quickly yeah. is that I refuse to believe that I live <laughs> in that world. Yeah. But, but game I, it out. Do you I'm, not see it? But I might. Yeah. Which Democrat realistically is going to vote against Dick Cheney? Uh, Liz oh, Cheney? I think she only would get, Bernie. Sure, she, yeah. I think she'd get confirmed. I, I think. Uh, yeah, well, but that's, why? Yeah. Why she says, them? "I want a Republican in my cabinet." When Kamala is asked, "What do you agree with on Liz Cheney?" She says, "Ukraine." Okay, so that's flagship policy. Uh, what's the real distance between them on foreign policy? Not very much. I mean, you know, Kamala's in the post Iraq era. She's never had to answer or vote for <clears throat> the Iraq War. So uh, on Gaza, I mean, like realistically, what they semi the same policy. Uh, Kamala says, uh, "What's the last show we did?" Iran. Kamala says, "Iran is our greatest yeah. adversary." That's an answer straight out of a Cheney's mouth. I mean, I mean keep, I'm not seeing that much distance. They, what, you know, what they keep saying quietly yeah. to the people who are critical of, of this whole thing is that we have not moved to accept Liz Cheney. You know, it's the Republicans who changed, yes. and Liz Cheney just supports us because we defend democracy. Uh -huh. The second that you're like, hey, you want to be Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense? Yeah. Then either you have moved or you have 
always been a warmonger party. I, look, and I'm, and I think that both are true. Yeah. Both, both in some ways are true, but they don't want to necessarily admit that. Yeah, uh, I'm curious just to see how it plays out if she does win, because I mean that that would really give away everything. And like I said, yeah, I, yeah. I really do believe she would get confirmed. Everyone seems to think it would be a fight. How? They've been calling her a hero for fucking four years. Um, no, you know, I think they'd confirm said, her. And when they say you would have a Republican in your, you know, a Republican in your cabinet, I don't think she means Secretary of Transportation. I, I just, maybe I'm is, wrong. Is Ray LaHood Ray La um, still alive? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. But, but Obama named Ray LaHood a, re, a moderate Republican as transportation yeah. secretary. The other thing I kept thinking about is what did Obama do whenever he comes in? Who does he keep as the sect after? Robert Gates. Mm -hmm. And remember how much they touted that bipartisanship? They're like, look, we've got a Republican who runs the Secretary of Defense. And then who else did he pick, Ryan? Chuck Hagel, who mm -hmm. was a Republican senator. So the precedent is there. For some Liz Cheney, you know, type yeah, figure Cheney. to be the sec def. <laughs> By the way, she could be yes. like, oh, her father, he he was a sec def under, I think it was under Reagan. You know, he had a long time experience. She she grew up around it. So I'm just telling people the case is there. I, I'm you heard it here first. I think it's gonna happen. I could be totally it, wrong, but I see it. The yes, staffing the the best thing about a Harris administration would mm. be the war over staffing it, mm. because that that would be the that would be the. That would be the civil war uh, <laughs> that we've been seeing over the last 15 years yes. playing out in miniature in, in just a couple of months. At, right. at drop site, we're actually uh, going to basically, we've got, we're putting budget aside just just for the transit, just yeah, the should. transition, reporting well, on the transition. The other fascinating And it'll be dynamic. interesting if it's Trump. So, yeah, well, yeah. It, it will be a fascinating dynamic either way. With Harris, something I keep thinking about is uh, if the likelihood is you're going to have a GOP Senate, so are they even going to confirm a single one of her people, <laughs> right? I mean, for real. Like, just a, so, bunch of, uh, a bunch of acting people. So legally, what would happen is that she would almost be forced to keep the Biden cabinet because they have been in, uh, hmm. they've already been confirmed and she could bring them over. And then so that could create its own yeah. really, yeah, exactly. So then you or you could have just actings, but that's really difficult for security clearance wise and all that. So anyway, we're getting in the weeds, but listen, folks, you know, preview of the show for two months from now, because that's what hopefully we'll be talking about either either direction. Staffing is so interesting about who they pick and what's going to happen. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to BreakingPoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify.